Well, what a wonderful treat we've had. We've had Professor Paul Rotman, who talked to us about the systems. We had Professor Oscar Marin, who talked to us about individual neurons and how they connect and give rise to the brain. And then, of course, we heard from Professor Janet Treasure, who talked about how the disease manifests itself in society and the very importance of lived experience. What wonderful talks, but now we have the pleasure and the privilege of being able to question Professor Oscar Marin about some of the things he said. Now, I understand um, that there are some questions that have already come in for us. Jill, are you going to lead us into those questions? That's great, Shitish, yes. Lots of questions coming in from a fantastic session just now. So, a uh, question from somebody who likes to remain anonymous, but uh, not an easy question, actually. So, from an evolutionary perspective, what is your view of why brain, human brain development spans such a large proportion of the natural lifespan? There you go, Oscar. Why do we remain babies for so long? It, in terms of brain development? It is a fantastic question for which we don't have an answer. I guess that we can speculate uh, uh, what that might be. There's great variation in, in how brains are built in, in evolution. Some of them, you know, um, uh, for some animals at birth, they are more or less complete. Um, but for primates, and in particular for uh, humans, uh, we have a really protected uh, period of, of development, and there are many uh, changes that happen uh, postnatally. My speculation will be that that gives us an advantage to have a really plastic period in mm. early life to acquire a lot of experience, to learn a lot from our peers, from our family, from uh, the rest of society. And, you know, remaining in that kind of plastic state may give us advantage to, uh, to develop farther in more later in life. Yeah. Social brain, if you may. Yes. But uh, so what is the age? Can you put a number when the brain stops developing? Well, as, as a developmental neurobiologist, I like to say that the brain never stops developing. Good. And that um, when we learn, when we forget uh, things, we change uh, the yeah. connections of our brain. And to some extent, we are recycling the same mechanisms that, that help us to build the brain in the, in the first place. But if we look at, you know, growth of the brain and, and remodeling of synapses in this early phase, probably this, you know, 20 years, you know, 18, 20 years, yeah. Uh, we still see changes in frontal regions of the cortex, which are the ones that develop the, uh, the uh, latest. Uh, um, so it's quite remarkable that, you know, during all it these, is. you know, mm. early life, teenage years, our brain is still uh, very much uh, immature. It's not quite the final product. Right there. Well, I think many parents would agree with that. But uh, Jill, what are the other questions we have? Well, building on that, Shittish, so anecdotally, lots more people getting an ADHD diagnosis in adulthood. Mm. And is this an issue of missed opportunity in the life course or is it because of our new knowledge now? There you go. So undoubtedly, there's more adult ADHD now. What do you think is the main reason that we have that? Well, I, I, I'm not a clinician. I think that my colleagues that are um, on, you know, on the clinic will have a better um, answer for that. My feeling is that, that we are now um, you know, better prepared to uh, diagnose some of, these, mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of these conditions. Um, but as I was alluding in, in my talk, there are um, changes in our brain that happen relatively early that can maybe only manifest clinically much later in life. Mm -hmm. and, a good example of that is psychotic disorders that, that we like have. Like schizophrenia. Like schizophrenia, yeah. for example, that we, we know that, that you know, we have very good evidences of early changes that may only manifest clinically when, when the person, you know, have his first psychotic mm -hmm. episode, and that might be in the late uh, teen years or early 20s. Um, so I think it's all related to the fact that our brain takes a long time to mm -hmm. settle into kind of a final kind of configuration, and that obviously then external um, uh, environmental, you know, pressures, right. stress, social stress, um, many other problems, drug abuse, uh, may actually end up, you know, deviating, you know, given the final push mm -hmm. uh, that lead the brain to manifest into, uh, into a pathology. So going back to the original question, I think that there's probably um, a lot more diagnosis now. We understand better these conditions. And also the fact that some of these um, uh, deficit may appear later in life mm -hmm. for reasons that we still quite don't understand yet. Right. I mean, at one level, it's a bit worrisome, for a lack of a better word, that something could happen very early in life, uh, but not show up through your uh, early childhood and teen years and actually start manifesting in adulthood. On the other hand, that there, there is some hope there because it gives you 15 years to intervene and do something about it. Yes. So what are the prospects of sort of early intervention into deviant brain development 
uh, with a way of sort of helping it. I think this this is a general thing that is emerging in in the treatment of not only psychiatric conditions but you know neurological conditions like neurodegenerative uh, disorders. We know that many of these conditions, that the, the biological root is there many many years before um, it manifests clinically. That also tells you about the absolute robustness of, of our brain. You know, the mm. brain tried to cope to compensate to compensate for for many of these uh, uh, insults uh, for a long time before that manifests into pathology. In the case of, of developmental disorders, that that as you said, give us the opportunity if we can identify them early enough, um, we can try to intervene to modify these trajectories Trajectory. that I was talking about and that kind of normalize uh, uh, the progress of, of a condition. Um, so that suggests that they might not be inevitable and, and that I think that there are interventions that you can do. And in the case of psychosis, I think that there are interventions at the level of you know, behavioral therapy and control in the schools and control bullying that already have shown to have a very important input into, um, into you know, moving from a prodromal phase of the disorder to, right. to a clinical phase. So, um, so I think that recognizing that they start very early gives us the opportunity to intervene, to intervene. also earlier. Now, now you talked that early intervention you know, with behavioral therapies, psychological therapies, or interventions in school can change the course of potential illnesses like schizophrenia. Do they do that by changing the brain development, or do they do that by compensating for abnormal brain development? I don't think that we know the answer uh, to that. To some extent, they're they are both <coughs> related. Um, it definitely adds through the plasticity of the brain. Right. Um, it is very difficult to know whether it's because it's acting on a primary mechanism and finding a compensation for that primary alteration, or most likely because it's finding another way to compensate to through balance. a parallel system or, or through you know, another, uh, another route. Um, I think that's an important idea mm -hmm. because uh, we don't necessarily need to go back to the original scene, so to speak, to the early um, changes in the brain and try to bring that back into Reverse. normality. We can find maybe other ways to compensate for those alterations um, by, by you know, profiting to some extent of the plasticity of the human oh, brain. Of the brain. Good. Now, I know there's lots of questions waiting. Our time's running out. So, Jill, I turn to you to... Thanks, Shitish. So, great question from Joe Casey. So, Oscar, do you think that we will find a single molecule that can ah. be used for treatment targets, or is this a circuit-level problem requiring more complex mm. interventions? Right. So, um, I think that there will be no magic uh, pill for conditions that are so extremely complex. Uh, um, humans produce very complex behaviors, and many uh, systems are lightly affected in in, uh, in neurodevelopmental disorders. Now, that being said, I think that we will be able to find, identify targets to modify specific cell types in a specific circuits that will help us to, to treat this, uh, these conditions. Um, again, going back to some of the concepts that I, that I uh, put down in my talk, I think that the level of understanding of the proteins uh, that are expressed in individual cells is going to transform pharmacology over the next 10, 20 years. I, mm -hmm. I think um, we are going to know a lot more precisely um, of receptors that perhaps are only expressed in cell types and, and not others, and that's going to help us to screen compounds that will be much mm -hmm. more specific. Um, but overall, I think that we'll need a combination of, oh. of uh, uh, treatments to be able to tackle one of these uh, conditions, probably not just targeting one single compound, but maybe several of them. Several compounds, well, yeah. okay. and, and of course, you know, from what you said, that you, you said that even behavioral and psychological therapies, in some sense, act through finally changing brain circuits. So, so this isn't just about whether it's drugs or whether it's therapies, it's how it all comes together uh, in that context. Now, we're probably running the clock here, but Jill, is there another question and is there time? Yes. There's one last question, I think, Shitish, from Sarah Shano. So how do we integrate these genomic approaches uh, with our population health needs? And what's the opportunity over the next five to ten years? We've only got 40 seconds, okay. so I so don't now, know how, how do we go from, answer that. <laughs> how do we go from you, Oscar, to Janet? The entire spectrum from the molecule to lived experience. But and how do we integrate that? I, I think there is a need for... There is a clear need for <coughs> stratification of, of our 
population of, of uh, patients, we need to understand probably through genetic and molecular approaches how we can stratify the patients. But obviously, coming from the public health uh, perspective, there will be a lot of data uh, coming from those analyses that will also contribute to this uh, stratification. So I think that there is you know, a lot of mathematics involved uh, yes. uh, here, but you know, both approaches will, will you know, sort of be able to help us to, to stratify yeah. our patient population. But, but I think that is probably a, a good note on which to end and to emphasize that is why academic health science centers like the King's Health Partners will have a very central role because it won't be a single gene, it won't be a single drug, we'll have to synthesize all of it, but then to remind ourselves for it to be really useful, we'll have to deliver the results in a system which is deeply embedded in a context and a culture. So look, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, first of all, Oscar, for your wonderful talk and for staying around for questions. Thank you to Professor Paul Rotman and to Professor Janet Tresher, and thank you to you.